I almost try not to read from screens anymore, and the reason for it isn't just kind of normal phone addiction, is that what I realized is how valuable your own associative thinking is. So when you're reading off a screen, inevitable, it's inevitable that basically your associative reasoning, either because you see a hyperlink to something else or you're presented with something else or you're distracted by something else, is most often coming from outside of you. When you're reading sort of a book, if you have an association or if you think of another book, if you choose to even look something up on your computer at the same time, all those kinds of associative processes are coming from within. Okay, hello. Welcome to Cambridge Forum in Harvard Square. Thank you for joining us on this frigid January evening to discuss a growing and all-pervasive social development, the presence of robots. It was my birthday this week, and I answered the phone to a robotic voice from the local pharmacy wishing me a happy day. I was not impressed. Remember back when robots were touted merely as tools, as handy replacements for putting people in dangerous or monotonous situations out of that? Think of the metal humanoid C-3PO from Star Wars, or the robots from Terminator, or even the lovely Wally. Well, all that's changed in the past five years. The role and range of robots has morphed into something beyond all expectation. Bots are now big business and a large part of our lives. We converse with them on our phones, in our cars, and in our homes. They are our new personal assistants, servicing our needs, listening to our commands and our problems. But what else are they doing? Are they spying when they are monitoring our emotions? And what's happening to all that data? By 2021, there will be as many voice-activated assistants on the planet as there are people. So why are we bringing these bots into our lives? And what is the price that we're paying for this convenience? I'm Mary Stack. I'm director of the Cambridge Forum. And tonight, we have two wonderful speakers to help us navigate this new world order. Judith Shulevitz got my attention straight away with her November cover story for Atlantic Monthly, which was entitled, Alexa, Should We Trust You? In the essay, she examined the social and psychological effects of voice-activated technology in the present and the future. Judith is a critic, author, and journalist. She's been a columnist at the New York, book, New York Times Book Review, Slate. She was a science editor at the New Republic, and she's contributed essays and articles to New York Magazine, The New Yorker, and Atlantic Monthly. To join her, we have Maxime Pozdorovikin, an award-winning director-producer based in New York. His most recent feature, The Truth About Killer Robots, premiered at the 2018 Toronto Film Festival and was broadcast on HBO Documentaries. His killer robot film considers the ethical dimensions of using robots in everyday life and the side effects of doing so. Max says he's concerned about the human cost of this technology and what it does to us. Quote, false hope perpetrated by this narrative of what robots can do for you made me want to make a movie about what they do to you. So to help us discuss, Max is going to explain, first off, why he made the documentary. Thank you, it's very nice to be here. Um, you know, I had this incredible opportunity, kind of a blank slate to make a film about automation for HBO. And for years I had thought about how do you make something about automation, it's a major transformative force. And I didn't quite know how to do it. So, I, so as I started researching, I kept on reading a lot of the books and articles and watching a lot of the news reports about the subject. And I noticed one thing was that all of it, as it says in there, were kind of, had this marketing premise about how robots can help you. And then occasionally it would mention something that they could, that maybe they will at attain general intelligence and then harm you. But the sort of a minutia of a qualitative way in which uh, automation and mechanization of society was happening and it was affecting us was really elusive and you could never, and, there, and people almost never mentioned it. So the only kind of thing was quantitative data about the projections about this many jobs will be automated by this point. And I wanted to kind of grapple with this sort of uh, qualitative side of it. So 
there was an incident, and I, but I didn't know how to do it, and there was an incident where um, an industrial manipulator arm at a Volkswagen plant crushed the chest of a worker uh, in Germany. And so we went to this Volkswagen factory and all the workers were forbidden from talking uh, about the, uh, the incident, but all of them were very eager to talk about, to talk about the way that automation has transformed their work environment and the way that kind of the human workforce has disappeared in a way that that, that has changed. So I thought, here, let's make a film which looks at these incidents, which may seem like freak accidents of robots killing a human and then consider other implications there. So for example, that incident became a way of looking at the history of, uh, of automation of manufacturing production. And the second incident that we consider in the film is the, is the case of, it can, the second act considers the service sector and it's a case of a, a driverless Tesla causing an accident where the driver is decapitated because he was watching a movie. And there we tried to look at the service sector and the way that we cooperate, and this is something that Judith kind of writes a lot in her article as well, the way we cooperate with this technology. And the third incident that we looked at was a case in Dallas where a bomb disposal robot was used to sort of blow up a guy, a, a guy who had been an active shooter and had already killed five cops. And in, and in that incident, it was, what was fascinating to me was the fact that on the surface of it, it seems really kind of unproblematic. Had the sniper that we have in the film, whom, whom we interview in the film, had he killed this active shooter, there would be nothing noteworthy about it. But the presence of a robot, even though it wasn't autonomous, even though it was kind of a dumb robot, still feels awkward. It feels off, it's sort of chilling. And so I tried to build a film around this. And you know, as I was um, thinking about all this, I reread uh, Judith's article for Atlantic, and it's so fascinating <laughs> because it appeared under two titles. Initially was, Alexa, should we trust you? So it's about you, the technology. What's, what's it, how is it doing for us? How is that structure? Is it going to use the data it gathers against us? Is, so it's sort of thinking about that actively. And the new title that I saw yesterday on the sort of online version is, Alexa, how will you change us? Mm. And I thought that that distinction is so significant and it's mm. wonderful because I think what's so great about your article is precisely that you grapple with that. You grapple, you know, right away with what is uncomfortable when a, an Alexa tells us sweet dreams. Right. Like, why does that feel so creepy? Because we know <laughs> what it is. It's a technology that we're about. We, we're in, we sign on for what it's supposed to do, and yet we still feel that. And what I find fascinating even, and I didn't know how to write about this in many ways, because even language seems to fail us a lot in trying to discuss these kinds of qualitative elements. So the, uh, the sweet dreams that you make mention of is the anecdote in my piece, uh, which begins the piece, which kind of explains why I wrote uh, the piece, which is, uh, so I, I had an Alexa. I had an Alexa and I had a Google Home. By the way, I prefer Google Home, but anyway, smarter. Um, I had purchased a skill for my Alexa, which was called lullabies, which I was using to get to sleep at night. But something had gone wrong, and so, so this skill, would play lullabies and then sign off with sweet dreams, which I kind of liked, you know. I, I like these enactments of human rituals with the computer. Um, but something had gone wrong. I have this image of a piece of algorithm, just of code, just sort of floating around somewhere inside my Alexa. And it had attached itself to every interaction. So every time Alexa was signing off, she said sweet dreams, which I found incredibly moving. I mean, not incredibly moving, a little bit moving, because of course I knew it was fake, but it was just charming. And I thought, isn't it odd that I'm being moved? Isn't it odd that even though I know this is a computer saying sweet dreams to me, that I find it comforting? Also, you know, like many, many people, uh, apparently, because there's data on this, hundreds of thousands of people uh, do this, they say, and of course, you know, of course, Amazon knows because they keep track. They say, I'm lonely, I'm depressed, I want to kill myself. So, um, and there are things that happen when, that, when you say, I want to kill myself. But, but I would say, you know, especially when a piece of writing was going badly, I would say to Alexa, Alexa, I'm fucked. Alexa, I'm lonely. <laughs> you know, I would try to talk to it, even though I knew it couldn't, you know, respond to me in any way. So I wanted to know, what is this bond? And then, uh, I hope this isn't going on. Then I, I became uh, interested uh, in the nature of the bond, which was voice. 
right? When we think of robots, we think of, you know, these animatronic, you know, things that you have in your movie. They have bodies, they have faces, they're uncanny, right? They, they're in the uncanny valley. But actually, the robot revolution is here. There, we have robots all around us, and they're voices. They're just disembodied. And they, I became very interested in, in how the voice affects us physiologically, neurologically, and of course, emotionally, that we can't help but respond to voices. And then, as I was researching this, I became aware of a branch of uh, computer science research that I'd never heard of called <coughs> effective computing, which is uh, research into um, artificial emotional intelligence. So, um, and what that is is, uh, and this is all, over, all around us now, um, computers can analyze our faces, our voices and our body language to detect what emotions we're feeling. Um, and that's one piece of it. And the second piece of it is emotion synthesis, which they're trying to do in their bots, their voice bots, and eventually their robots. Um, that is to say, create simulations of emotions. And the final piece will be when the emotion detection can actually inform the emotion synthesis and we can really like have a conversation. And that's the ultimate in bonding. And what's, you know, so then in the, in the article I asked the question, well, you know, what is this being used for? What will this actually do? How will this change us when we can really have these simulated, or are they simulated? Maybe they're not simulated relationships with our, you know, artificial devices. You know, you touched upon something very interesting that I thought a lot about, and it's the way that the word robot is used. And historically, when you look at it, what happens is, is when, uh, when a machine is first introduced, it's called a robot. When it becomes ubiquitous, it just becomes a machine. Hmm. And I think that our thinking about AI is often has this similar kind of blind spot, where we tend to kind of project it into the future when we think about robots. That one day, we have this model of a Terminator that's completely... Uh, that's completely independent and malevolent, and then, or a certain kind of general intelligence that we will one day reach. And a lot of the uh, kind of news pieces that you see done are kind of about this, are we there, or are we not there? And there's a lot of, for example, films made around the premise, like, can a robot be a, a cinematographer? Can a robot edit, a, can an algorithm at, edit a movie? Can a, a robot be a director of a movie? And the answer is like, of course not, because these are highly, complex cognitive tasks. But, and I think that that gives us a sort of false sense of security that, that we're kind of unique. But it also kind of blinds us to what you were just talking about, to sort of the ubiquity of this technology, to the fact that artificial intelligence arrives mostly as a form of creating, of sort of data profiling and creating data modeling and kind of measuring our engagement. But because we're blinded by a lot of these ideas like, you know, general intelligence or the singularity. We tend to not look at things that will affect us probably a lot sooner. That are affecting us. That right are now. affecting us a lot. I mean, yeah. I mean in, let's set aside the algorithmic revolution, right? right? And, and talk yeah. only about things that we know we're interacting with, right? Like your phone call, hmm. right? Yeah. Like, the, like call centers that are using all this voice technology and are using emotion detection to produce a sort of uh, crude script, emotionally apt script. Um, you know, so it's, 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 um, it's not just hidden, it's visible, and we don't, or audible, I should actually say, uh, and, and yet we take it for granted, and we still think the robot revolution is yet to come. I, I, mean, I think also, um, I think we've kind of neutralized, by calling this person Alexa and Siri, they are, are friends, they're, they're helping us, they're doing things for us, they're assistants, and it takes the sinister aspect out of that equation. But there is a lot of sinister aspects to it because the data gathering is being done behind our back. Well, we're opting in. Um, I don't even think we're aware of it, a, a lot of what it's for. I, um, Shoshana Zuboff the other evening was talking about this. She's written a book called Surveillance Capitalism. And she was saying that just by having a nest on the wall of your apartment, that you're inviting in the equivalent of a thousand contracts 
to approve that information to go out. Right. That's true. And you don't even know where the data is going. True. Who ever asked us if we wanted our emotional needs to be part of future predictions? And that's what they're being sold as. Um, you know, our emotional, pr it's, it's more alarming than that, right? It's, it's um, our emotional needs um, are some, is something that can be picked up from our shopping data, mm. right? From our purchase data, our history of purchases and browsing. But it's an emotional, it's a very, very rich, thick, detailed emotional profile, um, which breaks down things that you can't see and I can't see about your facial expression, about your body language, about the tone of your voice. There are, you know, f you know 400 parameters that, you know, this, this fellow named Bjorn Schuler, who I interviewed in Germany, can break the, you know, can, knowledge that would astound you, like um, um, how tall you are from your voice, how tall you are, uh, how fat you are, um, what, you had, what, you, what you ate last, um, you know, all kinds of fascinating information. That's not emotional profile, but that's, that's you know, um, whether you're trying to suppress anger, whether you're anxious, whether your throat is constricted. Um, there's just all this information that you don't even know exists as information that they're gathering now. Because this stuff is, the emotion detection stuff is now going into cars, actually. Oddly enough, that's its first major sort of commercial application. Um, and the reason for that is actually uh, is embodied in your Tesla story. Um, because they don't want that happening again. They, they want there to be, they, they want the car to be smart enough to know when the driver is distracted and, and yet there's a problem and sort of wake them up. I mean, it, that situation was sort of beyond hope. But, you know, in other words, they, there's something called the handoff with autonomous uh, or self-driving cars where they want, the, the car needs to know whether the human is capable, emotionally capable of accepting the handoff. Uh, and, and the car also needs to know when the, emotion, when the human is too emotionally overwrought for one reason or another and control must be taken back by the car. And that's all happening now and it's going to go into the next generation of high-end cars. And I think another thing that's happening is also a certain kind of conceptual turf war. We had this, I had this exchange with one of the programmers at the Toronto Film Festival specifically about this incident because we all operate, as you see sort of in the Tesla case, under the concept of autonomous cars that can kind of get us from A to B without us doing anything. The companies that produce these things will for the longest time insist that they're assistants, that they're just kind of navigators. They're semi-autonomous. They're semi-autonomous. Right. And obviously that they will keep on insisting on that to prevent any, uh, to lessen their legal liability. And so I feel like that even when you're doing something like, let's say, writing a synopsis or describing this incident, these kinds of terms like semi-autonomous, autonomous, assistant, be become incredibly powerful in that hmm. they create this. And I don't even know which way to go because clearly when you look at the people who, let's say, drive these kind of driverless Teslas, they're operating under the concept of autonomous. And that concept is being sold, but then in the fine print, there are all these kinds of caveats that will make it almost impossible That's interesting. for interesting. I lot never of actually even thought about the legal implications of a driver in a semi-autonomous car. I mean, I think the semi, I think they're perfectly able to sell, they're ready to sell autonomous cars, but we're not ready to drive them. So I always thought that and heard that the reason people have to be in, that people have to be sitting at the wheel is because literally we're not ready to relinquish the wheel yet. But I think we're also not ready in terms of our legal categories aren't ready. And the yeah. pace at which the law will change will always be much slower than the, than the pace well, of now technology. Well, now that's something you brought up in your film that I thought was very interesting. I don't remember who said this, but he said, you know, there's, we have no way to regulate this because the pace of technology and of innovation will always be faster than that of regulation. Yeah, and I, and and I think that's, that that's, that's a, right. That's a very scary thought. And I think that even with... When kind of more and more advanced weapons are introduced, let's say, and th and they're more autonomous, what happens is sort of this dissemination of guilt and culpability, and that's the real danger. Because once a system of, of let's say killing somebody becomes so complex that there's literally hundreds of people that can be made responsible, then it's almost like no one is responsible. And it's it's hard to make any kind of changes. Yeah, uh, it's something that happened actually, like within the last week, <coughs> is. Um, Congress has had two bills introduced to regulate deep fake mm -hmm, technology. Yeah. Do, you, do you know about this? Deep fakes are, uh, you know, uh, 
you know, images um, that are complete, you know, images of, 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 of you sort of walking around and doing things that you simply didn't do and saying things that you simply didn't do, but that passes actual film and actual audio. Um, that, and that's out there. And uh, there's this debate about how do you regulate this because, or how do you, how do you, how do you write laws about this because as soon as a deep fake is introduced into the inter onto the internet, it goes viral or it is it cannot be stopped. So it's very hard to sort of, after the fact, criminalize it. And well, and this, is, this is one of the questions that was raised by uh, Zupoff the other night, that can we wrestle back our own personal data? Has it happened and is it beyond? Is the genie out of the bottle and can we never get it back? Can we pass laws to, to own our own data, to get it back? because it's being traded beyond our control. Look at the Facebook story yesterday, or the FaceTime story, where it was found that your, if you have your iPhone on and it's the, the 12 and it was in a group chat, it was going to be eavesdropping. And you were told to, take your, to go to your settings and take FaceTime down yesterday, which I did do off my yeah, phone. I did as well. But I think that we still should think more and more about our complicity in this, like specifically the issue of deep fakes. I suspect that it will arrive into mainstream practice on the wings of sort of responsible documentary. And I've seen this, for example, on Russian television already. Where what you will do is you will take a piece of historical archive, let's say a photograph of Abraham Lincoln, and then you will take something that he is supposedly had said, and then you will animate that photograph with him saying it, even though it's in. And it can bring to life in sort of a responsible way all sorts of historical, you know, material that has been kind of, that you couldn't animate or you couldn't make as dynamic for television or anything else. But now with that technology, with it's available, it's fairly easy to do and it's convincing. Now, once everyone gets used to that, then all the other boundaries are start to get blurry. And then, and I think that that's where it sounds gets like dangerous. You, sounds like you're playing with that in your... your I mean, as a yeah. filmmaker, it Yeah, you must it, be, you must be, be working fun. with that now. Yeah, no, but it's I, scary I, in the news context. Well, for us, you know, our movie's narr I think it's like the first movie narrated by like a robot, by kind of an android, which was created specifically to read the news. And for us, it was this idea that don't make it about, as I was saying earlier, like if a, if a robot can do something really complex, show how easy it is to do something this simple that, you know, and without hiring a voice actor. So for example, for us, we used Amazon and then added various effects to it, but we could tweak the voiceover all the way throughout the film. We didn't have to hire an actor. We didn't have to hire a studio. So that's autom automation in our, in our own business. And I feel like you have to embrace and grapple with those consequences as you go along. And a lot of times we tend to want to think about, okay, they're malevolent, how will we stop them? How will we regulate them? But we're, we're doing so much to not, to be totally complicit. And I think that both sides of a conversation need to be had. No, I agree. Yeah. I, I don't think that all robots are bad. I don't want to give that impression. Um, because in fact, I, I contacted Harvard Biodesign Lab has been doing all these robotic breaches you can put on if your legs were blown off and you know they're doing marvelous things with people that have spinal injuries that's great across the hall at the microbiotics lab they've got this thing called a robo b they decided to design this thing that's half the size of a paper clip and weighs a twelfth of a gram so they modeled it on a bee a real bee and of course they said oh it's going to be great for agriculture and surveillance and and then I was that's immediately a black that's actually out. a black mirror episode well it's really freaky because you know I was at Gatwick Airport a week a week after there was the drone problem so I'm thinking if this is what happened with drones now we've got bees mm -hmm. that you can hardly see so I mean it, it, it just fills me with horror the prospect the robot this. swarm <laughs> yeah, the robot swarm. Well, you know, there's there are there are fantastic medical applications. Mm. You know, it, yeah, so are. something I didn't get a chance to write about enough in my piece is uh, the voice techno voice analytics that can detect trace sort of um, Parkinson's in a voice long before any doctor could detect it. And that can detect even um, cardiovascular issues. Um, you know, so that's just with voice. Uh, they, you can use effective computing to help children with autism because, you know, the computer can detect the emotional inappropriateness <laughs> and train the child to behave with emotional appropriateness, which, if you happen to believe in the rights of the neuroatypical, is itself sort of malevolent and shocking. But if you want to help somebody with autism, it's kind of great. So, yeah, you can't, 
you can't deny that there are incredibly benevolent applications. But, but, see, it's, but see, it's so easy for us to fall into, specific, again, talking about robots and what they do for us. Like, I wanted to ask mm -hmm. you, what did you feel, or like, what do you feel when you pick up a telephone and you hear a greeting, and for a second it catches you, so you think that it's real, and then you have to kind of do that corrective and you realize that it's a machine. So like, what happens at that moment? What do you feel? It makes me angry. And it may, but it may, so it makes you, and it's very I don't go through the, ah, oh, I don't go through that phase. You, you don't know, go through the, that phase. You know, go sleep well or whatever it is yeah. you like them saying, sleep tight. No, I don't. I think, what, who, what are you? What, well, why are you coming into my space? You know, I mean, evolutionarily, we are not, whenever, so up until, you know, Thomas Alva Edison, basically, whenever we heard a human voice, that meant there was another human present, right? Um, so for hundreds of thousands of years, our species and, and its predecessors have associated voice with presence. And our, we react physically to presence, I mean emotionally and physically to presence. We are, are, are parts of our brains are engaged. Um, our heart may beat faster. Um, there might be adrenaline that, that, that flows through us. Um, you know, it's impossible not to react to the human voice as if it meant something more than a robot voice or a, an automated voice does. So I, that, that's what interested me, is in this, this sort of, you know, um, we know, but evolutionarily speaking and physiologically speaking, we don't know, we can't know, we're not designed to know. And that's the tension, that's, that's how, um, that is, that's how it, that's what it does to us, that's a to us. Yeah. And, okay, what I, and what, I, what I worry about is that we have these very, very few tools, like tools of imaginative understanding, tools that we use to understand another person, to connect emotionally with another person. And a lot of those tools are what you, you were just mentioning. So ability to recognize certain cues in voice and tone in terms of communication, in terms of voice. And I feel like that what happens is every single time you're kind of tricked into that. You're, let's say you see a robot expressing pain and you have to override your impulse to kind of reach out and help and say that every single time we do that, it's almost as if this institute of empathy is undercut and erodes a tiny bit. And that worries me again because mm. we have so few of these tools for kind of human connection. Yeah. And when Humanity, we're, yeah. I, I, I totally I agree. I so my question, Judith, yes, you, okay. you said you talk away to Alexa when you're at home and you're frustrated or you're bored or you're... Or I used to before I started unplugging all my devices, but aside ah, from that. Okay, so you want, well, now tell me why you... moved you, into the you, bunker. You, yeah, exactly. Why you did it and why you unplugged? Uh, so. I unplugged because I uh, became paranoid that it, even though... It's not supposed to be streaming to the cloud until I wake it up with the wake word. There have been incidents where things are being streamed to the cloud that are um, not supposed to be, and thus, uh -huh. and you know, so information is being given to Amazon and Google. I used Home and Alexa for, the, to, for this piece that I don't necessarily want to tell them. I also turned um, the microphone off on my iPhone because I didn't want to get those ads served up that were based on things I'd said conversationally in that room. You know, although everybody you talk to denies completely that that happens. I, I, I don't okay, know. you cited an, article, uh, an instance which was amazing in the article. I, I mean, I guess I'm in the wrong generation, but you talked about your sister-in-law saying something about at dinner time, it, having something on, Alexa on, saves her having to go up and check facts of one of the kids. Right, that wasn't my sister-in-law, but it was someone oh. I talked to, yeah, who said, you know, it allows us to keep our devices in our pockets because we just can say, you know, she, she gave this illustration of a conversation she was having with her daughters about which came first, the fork or the mm, spoon. The spoon. And, and rather than putting down the fork and spoon, whipping out the device, you know, looking it up, they, sh they could just ask Alexa and they could continue to eat, you know. Um, why it's, as, as a mother, I definitely have a problem with, you know, getting my kids to keep their phones in their pockets wow. or in their rooms at meals, even though, you know, there's a strict rule, but they violate it constantly. They can't help themselves, they're addicted. I guess my question is, why do you have to know the answer to that question exactly at that moment? Right. Well, you know, because you know, we like instant satisfaction. If it's so available, it, if it's available, who would say no? You know. But I, would you interrupt a meal to find out the answer to that? Well, you're having well, we, a conversation. We all we all have. We <laughs> all have. We absolutely have. You're having a conversation. You know, which is which is 
you know, which mountain is taller than which? You know, we went hiking on this mountain and that mountain, which one was taller? You whip out the phone, you figure it out, the conversation continues. That's how it works. Wow. You know, one thing that I, I changed in my behavior as a result of doing this film is that I almost try not to read from screens anymore, and the reason for it isn't just kind of normal phone addiction, is that what I realized is how valuable your own associative thinking is. So when you're reading off a screen, inevitable, it's inevitable that basically your associative reasoning, either because you see a hyperlink to something else or you're presented with something else or you're distracted by something else, is most often coming from outside of you. Mm. When you're reading sort of a book, if you have an association or if you think of another book, if you choose to even look something up on your computer at the same time, all those kinds of associative processes are coming from within. And I think that that's really valuable, specifically because a lot of those associations and a lot of those distractions are used for basically marketing ends. I agree. I agree. That, that would I be never my, thought of that. That's really that would interesting. would be my instinct. You, of course, you have to click on the links. You can refuse to click on the well, links. But even, but, but, but even if you're, if you're reading an article and you see a hyperlink to, let's say, the word population, right. or if you see it to another article yeah. about the backstory, it's still not coming from you. No, you're being directed. You're being Absolutely. directed. You're, you're being given directed. that option. You're made to contemplate that option. Also, I mean, you know, think back to uh, Robert Hoover and hypertext. I mean, there is a mind, right? It's part of, as someone who edited a, an online magazine for many years, Slate, um, you know, it, there was a mind behind the hyperlinking. So it was designed to be part of the reading experience. So I'm going to, as someone who designed that reading experience, I'm going to dispute that it's, there's something nefarious about it. But even just getting a text, I think, while reading something. No, that's very, you know, yeah. It's, no, this, yeah. It's, it's finding out, discovering that you, you, know, you read five pages of a novel and you quickly check your email and you think, whatever happened to that truly immersive experience? Mm. You know? Also, the word you just used, uh, was it wasn't led, but that was the word that Shoshana used the other night. She said it's the first time in history that apart from your behavior being predicted, it's now being directed, you're being herded in certain pathways, which is really sinister to me. I don't want to be herded. I don't want to be told to read this and buy that. And have I looked at that? Well, I mean, that's, it has ever been thus. It's just, I mean, since, since the advent of consumer capitalism anyway, but I mean, it's, well, it's just that the tools, the tools are so much more sophisticated than they ever yeah, were. Yeah, they're invisible. Yeah, and I think that the certain pathways are, so, are often kind of pathways that don't serve a particular function. They maximize engagement, but a lot of times what happens is that just the back end of social media is just this constant modeling of your behavior, and it's essentially tools of behaviorism being tried on you to see how you react. So it's always, uh, so I think that what's kind of pernicious is always being in that maze and being tested and having your kind of predictions be made by the algorithm about your level of engagement when you're stimulated in a certain way. Yeah. And that that's really the backside of all kind of internet advertisement I think is really pernicious and kind of, and, and sinister. Although, although I would and, still argue it has ever been thus. It's just that the tools of testing audience response are infinitely more sophisticated, right? Especially when the product, you know, what, they, what they're selling is your attention, right? That's the product they're selling. So they're, they're using, you know, consumer marketing to do it. But, but it, is, it, is, it is much more invasive and it yeah, is much and more Yeah, and because you live with your phones. But I want to go back, away. I want to go back to the question of empathy. I, I actually was thinking recently I want to write an essay. In fact, your movie inspired me to think that I want to really delve further into this question of empathy because you know you 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 have that philosopher John Campbell who talks about how um, uh, every time we have to um, I can't remember exactly what he says you probably do but every time we have to override that empathetic response and check it in ourselves you know we become a little coarser and a little mm -hmm. less empathetic um, but it seemed to me that there you can imagine the opposite scenario so we don't want to be have empathy for a machine because we think it's either going to do something to us or try to sell something to us. But what if we were able to see a machine as a kind of you know, embodiment of the intentions of its programmer, right, as an avatar? And we no longer had to check that response. We could have empathy, right? It's a sort of, it's a sort of uh, messenger between the programmer and us. It's not, it's not a given that we have to see the computer as, I mean, the, I'm sorry, the robot as our enemy or, I don't or think it's something so much that, about the that we enemy. have to blank I, the emotion out of or something. I think, again, if you flip it and think about what it's going to do to us, I think mostly robots will just make us more inconsiderate towards other people. And I'll give you kind of one 
thought experiment that I like. So if you think about it, you're driving on the highway and you want to switch lanes and you see someone in their side view mirror that's going really, really fast. Basically, you think it's a person, you don't cut that person off because you essentially project fallibility onto them. Maybe they're having a bad day, maybe they have a relative in the hospital, you let you them just pass, can't predict and then you just can't predict, yeah. and so you have a certain amount of caution when dealing with them. When you see that the, that the object next to you is an aut autonomous car, and you know that it's programmed, guaranteed to not bump into you, you will be the most inconsiderate driver to those cars. You will be cutting them off almost on a dare, and do this all the time, and inevitably, the fact that you will be driving very in, in, in an inconsiderate way for so, in, rel in relation to many cars that are autonomous, that will inevitably spill over into your dealing with humans. And I think it's the same thing with sex robots as well. It's just that it's a certain kind of approach that will inevitably spill over into our human right, interactions. Right, but I'm, I'm trying to argue, and, and I have simply just thought of this idea right now, and I'm a little incoherent about it, but I'm trying to argue that that is, an, that is a byproduct of the social role we have imposed on robots, right? They must serve us, they, you know, they must follow Asimov's rule number one and not hurt us, although, as you point out, now they do. Um, we have put them in this role where we must block off our emotions. But what if there were some other role they could play where they could, in fact, embody intentionality and uh, personality of some other that actually was human and that information was being transmitted back? In other words, not that example necessarily, but what if there's some way we could change the social role of the robot? See, and the reason for me what's difficult about that is that I want to think about robot technology is a continuation of automation. Mm -hmm. So if you just start, about, start thinking about it from a certain point in, let's say, 20th century or 19th century, 70s, or, or early kind of production, that there's a certain kind of increasing mechanization of society. Mm -hmm. So more and more parts of society are being subsumed into algorithmic regimes, into mechanical regimes. And so I feel like that as that's happening broadly, that's the question you have to think about. Right. How is this broad mechanization of all of human exchange, all of human interaction, human society, right. how's that have, changing? You have all those people saying, I feel like I'm more of a robot. Yeah. But the, the effective computing domain that I'm interested in right. is actually in the business of trying to re-infuse emotion into the human-robot interaction so that it is less automated and mechanistic. And that's, that's eerie and super creepy and could be kind of interesting because it's, it's, it's basically sort of saying it's not just a kind of rational computing intelligence that the robot is evincing or the computer or the bot or whatever it is. It could also be, you know, an emotional uh, intelligence that it is, it is purveying. And that emotional intelligence, of course, is programmed into it. And it need not be malign. It is malign because it's used now to manipulate you into buying more stuff, right? But it doesn't have to be. See, I feel like that, that can happen and it can be a small corrective. But ultimately, for example, the way that automation strips dignity from jobs or a sense of kind of skill level. So for example, for a lot of people, the ability to do something, even to drive a truck, is something that they get a lot of existential satisfaction from. And one of a kind of a broad effect I of I wouldn't say a lot. No, I think that if you know how to do something, you know, it's like I get a lot of satisfaction out of knowing how to drive a car that I've driven for 20 years, yeah. you know? And I feel like when, when you do it, but there is some kind of dignity that goes along with that. And when a, that's stripped away, no matter what it was, people, you know, have you know, a lot of problems with that and a lot of kind of, when you look at the kind of suicide rates and opioid addiction rates going up, I think yeah. that it's a, that's inseparable. It's hard to delineate it exactly, but it's yeah, inseparable. Yeah. Yeah. From no, I don't, I don't want to deny the main premise of, one of the main <clears throat> premises of your movie, which is that automation is going to, you know, make us jobless and we are going to have to come up with a new, new arrangement, uh, a new relationship to work. And, and as you say in the piece, in the movie, uh, a form of redistribution of the wealth, which is being concentrated in the hands of the, techno the tech giants who mm. are, you know, putting these automated devices out there. Absolutely, I'm just saying. What's kind of interesting is that having now stripped emotion out of these interactions with these other entities in our lives, they're busily trying to put it back in. Mm. You know, again, now for nefarious reasons. But it doesn't under if it weren't under capitalism, it could be different. But anyway.
Well, before we um, go any further, I think I'd like to invite anybody who wants to ask questions of our informed people to come up and pose some. I actually have a lot of questions, um, but first I would say that if you want to delve into the the dangers, perhaps, of, of adding emotion into interactions with robots, you should look at the work of Sherry Turkle at MIT. She's been studying this for years, and she really sees a lot of danger there. Um, not necessarily where you would expect it, not in being sold anything or herded anywhere. But I want to go back to Asimov's laws. A number of years ago, I heard Rodney Brooks, the inventor of iRobot, talk about the necessity of programming somehow Asimov's three laws of robotics into all robots. And now you say they don't, you don't even know what they're doing with the data they're harvesting. Um, are they thinking on the front end? Is anybody programming ethical laws into robots? I thought a lot, I have a section in the film about Asimov's laws, and so I thought about, I think engineers tend to have major kind of ethical blind spots, but you know, but, but even the example of Asimov's laws is always introduced as this way as that this is what we should do, but if you actually read the stories, what he does is say that, I think it's 2048, that's when he sets the story, uh, I could be wrong on that, but that basically by that point there will be enough robots all around that these incidents of kind of accidents or fatal accidents will be common enough where you, where you will need laws. That's the premise of the stories. But then what every single story shows is that no matter what law you pass, they will fail because humans are complicated, context is complicated, all these things. So I think that it's, the necessity is there and regulation is there, but there's also, one shouldn't be blinded by this idea that once you integrate that, you know, who knows what it, that would even look like, that it would solve the problem. Yeah, and I want to just go to your Sherry Turkle point. Um, yes, she does wonderful work, particularly with the human-robot interaction with children, and what does it mean to be growing up with these companions? Um, and, you know, she too feels that it's going to lead to a failure of uh, empathy, but more dangerously, in a weird sort of way, uh, of the ab ability to imagine yourself into the way of the other, of a recognition of the existence of the other, right? Because you don't have to, you're not really in the presence of an other. You're in the presence of something other than an other, if that makes any sense. Um, so that's, that's, I think that's kind of brilliant. She is, she is quite brilliant. Um, there is a, on the question of the ethical robot, there is a, a novel coming out by Ian McEwen, you know, who wrote Atonement and, and other novels like that, called Machines Like Me, that I, I just read the advanced galley proofs, and it deals with a robot who, uh, whose ability to reason ethically is far more sophisticated than the humans he is living with, and the, uh, but he has a sort of Peter Singer-like utilitarianism in the sense that he wants the greatest good for the greatest number. That's his, that's his, that's, you know, his ethical framework, and it ends up being you know, uh, fatal for the people, or terrible anyway, not always fatal, for the people he lives with, because he's such a great moral reasoner, but he, he, he starts from a, premise, a questionable premise. But it's not a given that a robot can't have an ethical... Uh, can't have an ethical program programmed into it. No, but I think some of the great thinkers have been concerned about this. I mean, Elon Musk and... Um, uh, Nick Bostrom. I yeah. think Nick Bostrom has a paperclip experiment where I think that a lot of times that the vast majority of robots will not fall into malevolence or sort of good deeds. They will just have a very, very narrowly defined you know, purpose for their existence, and they will sort of pursue, and as they get more intelligent, they will just be more and more clever at pursuing that one purpose. So, and, you, and I think that the Nick Bostrom experiment is, is a robot that just makes paper clips, but will go to such extreme lengths to continue making paper clips that he destroys humanity. Right. <laughs> and then there's this whole other thing that actually I discovered that I, again, didn't have a chance to write about because space is so limited. So there's a there's an audio, uh, you know, uh, audio computing expert in Germany named Bjorn Schuler, who uh, is very interested in sort of mapping out on a graph where all the human emotions are and the shades are, and finding those locations where he feels there's no emotion associated with it. And he says those are the locations where 
robots will sort of fill in and have robot emotions. And um, I'm blanking on her name, the, the, the creator of Jibo, uh, what's her name? Oh, Cynthia Brazil has mm -hmm. talked about how, you know, her Jibo and her creations, she believes, will begin to have authentically robotic emotions that are theirs and not ours, which is sort of kind of cool. So this is a fascinating discussion. My name is Norman Dowston. Given that the percentage of robots now which are really doing good for humanity compared to those that are just trying to sell us something or influence our behavior and even emotions such in Facebook, how are we going to get this realization out to more people. I wonder if perhaps the vocabulary that we use is um, a little prescriptive. We call them assistants. What if we call them friendly sounding spies? <laughs> Which friendly. is what they are yeah. these days, isn't it? Yeah, that's what they are. They're, they're, they're always, they're ubiquitous, they're reliable, we know what they're gonna say, and um, you know they're always gonna be loyal you know, except insofar as they're selling your secrets to the highest bidder, <laughs> you know. The question I think of, I, I always, with this topic, I keep on going back to the question of language, and even when I myself talk about some of these things, let's say some of the consequences of automation, I'm surprised at the fact that I feel squirmy, let's say, using the word dignity, that it somehow it feels slightly corrupt for describing for, you know, let's say, uh, manufacturing labor as having any kind of dignity and and part of that I think part of a discomfort is because we see it on like you know humans shouldn't have to do this work but that's looking at it just through the calculus of what they're doing you know in a lot of these productions they're gathering with other people they have some kind of social intercourse they have some kind of status that they establish and they can realize themselves and all that stuff kind of gets lost when you look at it exclusively through the GDP, uh, through the filter of GDP and right. efficiency and a return on investment and production. Right. And what I find so fascinating is that even when people talk about it sympathetically, they, they express concern for what will happen for automation. It's still through those parameters. It's still using the language of economics. It's still kind of approaching it only through the, right. that kind of lexicon. I, th I thought you were going to go to a different place, which is this idea that we, um, tend to dismiss as, as satisfying or as having human dignity, you know, sort of work on an assembly line, work that is a sort of designed by automation, right? But as you say, they have unions, they have communities. Um, I'm working on something about, you know, uh, mill workers, young female mill workers of the 19th century who had all these educational societies and, you know, all kinds of things that, and they were so happy, these girls were so happy to get off the farm and work at these mills and be around other young women. Um, so it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily lack dignity. And it's definitely true that the thing that most lacks dignity is not having a job and not having a source of income or not having a thing that you do. Well, I, I think we're just looking at one end of the labor market here. I mean, I just read a report Mother Jones did on the future of work. And they said, you're delusional if you don't think this is going to affect high-skilled labor. It's nothing to do with just blue collar. Surgeons are going to be replaced. Yeah. It's much more effective and efficient to have someone who can work for indefinitely with no breaks or yeah, downtime. It's, going to be, it's actually the um, sector that's going to be as, well, the sector that's going to be most heavily hit in the immediate term is drivers, right? Truck drivers, mm. all drivers. But eventually the sector that's going to be decimated is middle management, mm. basically. So any, any, you know, any sort of accounting, any sort of, um, you know, anything that is within an industrial or organizational process that can't be rationalized. So, you know, um, you know, the middle manager, basically, who just makes sure that the quotas are met or supervises the workers, that's going to go. Uh, you, don't need, you don't need humans for that. Well, in the service sector, you know, I just <laughs> walked in and got a drink at CVS beforehand, and you sort of, the job of the people there are now just to make sure that, that you use the iPad correctly. Right. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. And but I'm also worried about the actual culture being lost. Our actual culture, we're giving it away. I mean, humanity, our values. I mean, how do you program values into a robot? No, and I think that, you know, even those kinds of, but even those kinds of connections, a connection that you can have with a person at a cash right. register, even at the level of looking at another person in the eye, those things are important 
in not having them throughout your day does make you feel more human, just like you know, certain kinds of democratic institutions, whether it's like the post office or the army, would force you to confront people that aren't like yourself. And in a way, now we're mm -hmm. just confronting ourselves right. via the right. narcissism You have that beautiful image in your movie of that girl who goes to the 24-hour store, which is totally automated, and it's sort of this lighted yeah. uh, space in, a, in, a, in, a, in the black night. It's very, it's haunting, yeah. beautiful. We're, yeah, we have a scene which is basically a day in the life of a Chinese blogger who has no interactions with a human during the whole day. And part of that, what we wanted to realize is that China has this tremendous advantage in terms of, uh, in terms of data for behavior. Because Ch in Ch China, they didn't have credit cards that much. They weren't that widespread. So they effectively leapfrogged the credit card portals. And now everyone just pays with WeChat, which is like the Swiss Army app, the biggest app in the world that everyone uses. And so China now has a tremendous amount of data about what people do, not just online, not just with, the, with their phone, but out in the physical world. And as a lot of the dynamic marketing becomes smarter and smarter outside all around you in supermarkets and refrigerators in supermarkets, th that will be much more dependent on data that people create in the physical world, the way that they move through space. And so that's, you know, and that, and, and, that and scene was sort of a realization of Speaking of ubiquity, I mean, of course, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll say one last thing and then we'll listen to your question. Um, you know, the future of, of voice, is, voice automated digital assistant, sorry for the word, um, is that they will be in all of the Internet of Things. So you will be talking to your refrigerator, you will be talking to your toilet, and your toilet will be gathering information <laughs> on you and sending it back to the, send, streaming it back to whoever, the toilet manufacturer or, or the government, which wants to know about, you know, wants to know about it for plumbing reasons. I don't know. Anyway. Oh my goodness, well now you've brought up a whole other <laughs> issue, which is, yeah, how do you possibly opt out of all this stuff? Because, yeah, I don't <laughs> want people to know all this, but my <clears throat> the reason why I walked up here was uh, more about community and sense of community and that it's vital for people's mental health and the health of our society for people to be in community and have real connections. And you've alluded to, in the workplace, you know, your your people are losing some of that um, social structure and real community connections that they had through work. But I'm also concerned about people that are in their house <laughs> pretending to communicate with somebody when they're really not. And you know, this the whole breakdown of um, of what's going to keep people saying, you know, so I don't know what your reaction to that is or how, um, you know, it's possible to turn some of this around. I'm not sure I actually believe that social media and, you know, the technology we're currently using, let's set, set aside the technology we're going to be using, is actually resulting in thinner communities. I mean, I'm just extrapolating from my own life. I keep in much closer touch with my relatives, and, okay, I'm not allowed to use FaceTime anymore, but I used to, <laughs> I did, uh, you know, and was able to see, you know, babies who would not otherwise have been able to I see and then who can see me and get to know me. Um, you know, I run into somebody I've had a, you know, Twitter interaction with on the street and we have a little bond there that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, possibly there's a, a sort of question of time management, like if I'm using, spending all this time on these devices, I'm not, you know, in the civic groups that Robert Putnam wor worried was, were disappearing. But I don't, I actually think that there's a case to be made that social media and the sort of technology we have now can make relationships thicker or communities thicker and not thinner. And not to be, you know, Pollyannish about it, but you probably I'll don't be, I'll be the downer. Um. <laughs> That's true for certain, certain people, but I don't, I don't know if you can say... Well, I think it's generational. I, I'm an outgoing right? person, you know, and I'm a comfortable person having connections, then it applies to everybody. I don't think... I think I don't know. I think we're just moving away from from community in a lot of ways. But anyway, I think anything that's as momentous and as transformative as the things that we're talking about obviously creates all these different effects and has all these different consequences, and for different generations as well. And that's why I feel like being trapped in the prism of thinking about, okay, I'm using my phone too much. Let me try to use my phone to connect with people, or rather than looking just passively, I'm going to kind of do something more active and connect. 
But I think that, that what happens is, and this is the stuff that's harder to talk about, is that we're, is the ways in which the ability to connect is, slips away. What happens to you when you're interacting in a place and you just feel the urge to check your phone? And it's those things in the way that, uh, that they're corrosive that I think is, 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 is more problematic. Because I think that, again, there's always the great delusion of our age is techno-optimism. And it's this idea that basically we've lost faith in the government being able to do anything or any big problems getting changed. But we still, because of how much marketing is sort of in our atmosphere, we still sort of believe that technology and gadgets will in some way kind of solve global solve warming and inequality right. and all these things. And we're, you know, we have tremendous blinders as a result of having imbued that, and it's impossible to kind of get away right. from that. Right, and this is this is uh, Sherry Turkle's real uh, objection to, you know, person, you know, these sort of, for example, Paro, the uh, the baby seal that is used to uh, give companionship to, you know, people in Japanese. Uh, assisted living communities and things like that uh, is, you know, and these 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 artificial companions don't push back. They're not rude. They're not difficult. They're not sulky. They don't resent you. They don't force you to do the difficult emotional work of actually having a relationship. And that is the problem. Now, again, I personally believe there is no reason that can't be programmed into your your robot, your personal robot. There is no reason the robot can't push push back and be difficult, but we are not learning with the way we've structured them as subservient and um, unworthy of, of uh, dignity and honor. Um, we are not learning the tools of having a relationship. Well, I think the question is, do we want a relationship? I think that's the key or question. Or do they want us to have a relationship? Yes, Because exactly. I think that they want the relationship to be with you and your own desires. Right, and because own Jennifer raised an interesting point just then when she said, you know, are we losing humanity? It's okay if I, could, if I was housebound and I had no ability to get out and about, yeah. maybe it would be nice to have Alexa talking to me morning, noon and night. You know, maybe that would give me this illusion. If Alexa were a little smarter, and that's what we well, have done. Well, whatever but. she does, I could program her to read me books or whatever it was. Yeah. Maybe that would give me some semblance of a feeling of I had this relationship or somebody to talk to. Mm -hmm. But that is not a substitute for a person, nor do I ever want it to be. I, I have a friend who works in, in research at BU, and he's totally really wired up about robots. He said, wouldn't it be wonderful to have a man you could come home to? These robots now, they feel like people. These Japanese robots, they can't keep them on the shelves, he said. And he said he could cook you French meals and he could read you poetry. And I said, no, I don't ever want someone that is, is not going to have an argument with me. <laughs> and see, and what happens is, at, by doing that, by accepting that, all we do is basically redefine what our idea of connection is. And then we say that, okay, let's define connection or intelligence as this, this, and this. Mm -hmm. The ability to deliver five things or six things right. to you. And most, most or, of them are services. Yeah, most of them are services. Or, but even if it wasn't an emotional thing, it's still impoverishing, let's say, by the depth of human relationships to say that, okay, if you can act like a therapist, like a Rogerian therapist, when you sense that the, the tone and the voice is edging towards depression, that that's what human connection is. I, it's, it's so funny because I'm usually the one being the the uh, Cassandra here, but I just I'm, I'm you're so you're so such downers. I'm like I'm, I keep wanting to be positive. What about if what if Cynthia Brazil and my 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 friend in Germany are right, and there are specifically robotic emotions that we can't have, um, and that we will have to grapple with, and then we'll have to then we will start having real relationships with robots. I'm not sure what robotic, robotic emotions are, though. what that would mean, yeah, in the what, sense what, that because that if, it's just a, if it's just sort of behaviors ba based on pattern recognition and data, that doesn't make sense to us. I don't know. I don't want to call those emotions. Well, they, they could be, it could be some strategic, something that, 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 that allows them to get from point A to point B as they have been programmed to do. But I don't... I don't I, this is like the inner drama of a, of a Roomba. Yes, exactly. <laughs> the inner drama the of a Roomba. The psychodrama of a Roomba's yes. journey. <laughs> yes, yes. No, I, I said if, then maybe this is a complete fantasy, but I like to think about it as a possibility. First off, just a quick anecdote uh, on the uh, notion of voice bots perhaps shifting behavior, you know, with the robocall, robocalls call coming in, I've developed a habit of, you know, I would initially listen and then I'd hang up with frustration. And, you know, over the last year, I've gotten more habitual around just quickly hanging up. 
Um, and then bef before when I'd get an actual call, I habituated myself to being at least polite, you know, before getting off the phone. But a few weeks ago, I got an actual call, and I just hung up. So in a sense, the, 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 it was your example around, uh, you know, would you cut off a, uh, a self-driving vehicle because it doesn't have any emotion? If you do that repeatedly, will you then become, you know, a worse driver? And I think I've become... A jerk. A jerk. <laughs> Wait, so let me just, let me, to, uh, let me drill down on... Telemarketers. <laughs> let me drill down on this. You hung up because there was a pause. No, uh, oh, no, no, well... There was that pause that you always get with telemarketers before the, the, the voice comes on. And when I hear that, I hang up. So, right, well, like, if someone called and then, like, was like, mm, I would just hang up on them, No, right? no, no, but so this time I knew about? it was real. You know, it was a, this time it was a real call coming in, but I was rude in a way that I wouldn't have been. Um, so, you mean it's affected your human behavior? Yes, it's affected oh. my human and behavior. And there's probably, no, but I mean, Towards that's actual human behavior. To a real person. To an person. actual human being. Oh, God. Yes. So what, what you right. no. Like you said, I've become, you know. Yeah, and those are the consequences of behavior right. because there is right. probably some algorithm that saw, that's been trying to call you at this time regularly. So you probably have some kind of Pavlovian response of annoyance at that time. Right. I'm, I'm, you anyway, know, spitballing I'm just concerned here, that I'm going to become a jerk on the road next. <laughs> yeah, okay. With, anyway, um, my question, uh, though, is um, having read the work of Yuval Harari, Sapiens, and Homo Deus, he's now got 21 rules to the 21st century, one of his premises is around medical technology and biotech, and that um, in the, in the, as, as, as that field advances, um, the notion of immortality is, you know, pot potential out there. It's even for my children, you know, he would suggest may live to five or six hundred years if they have the means and that in that that technology is not being distributed evenly and that for those who have the means could live and actually become super healthy and with genetic modifications and genetic engineering you're going to develop sort of the super species homo deus right that's separate from homo sapien and we'll move towards i think that the interesting point is moving towards a more authoritarian kind of future. Not more democratic, but more authoritarian, uh, in a sense. Well, we would certainly move uh, toward a ger the, gerontocracy, right? There'd be, too, there'd be a lot of old well, people, well, and there well, wouldn't be room for any young people. Certainly that. And that may not be so bad, having nice old people around. You know, but, mm, but I think his, I I well, or, yeah, I mean, maybe people should just let go. But the point is that um, access to that kind of care cannot be made available to 10 billion people, and that we're gonna be, the, the division between rich and poor yeah. mm -hmm. is gonna become greater. Yeah, and I think a lot of us, you know, in the, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, we, had, we projected a very different future, one of great equity. You know, here we are in, you know, mm. Unitarian Universalist Church. We, we, we imagined something different. So if you could just speak a little bit well, about that, that the... prediction or that, that cautionary piece that he brings up. And I think that the techno-optimism makes us believe that there's this kind of possibility that we're all saved. And I think that in reality, this is, uh, Mary, when you were mentioning earlier about the possibility of regulation, you know, one of the difficulties of regulation is that structurally, the internet privileges monopolies. And it will continue to privilege and kind of create these monopolies, which will uh, bring with it kind of an ever, ever increase in, in sort of structural inequality. Well, I, think, I mean, then monopolies can't be broken up. That's... I mean, there's antitrust regulation, but it's a, at this point, I mean, this is so ingrained in, in, the, in the sort of algorithmic infrastructure of how the internet is built, even antitrust regulation, I think, would fall short, and who knows how well, successful, to, successful yeah. it would be. I mean, I think the problem, I think, I think, so I happen to live in a gerontocracy. I live on the Columbia campus, and uh, universities are the great gerontocracies of our time, right? Because there's no retirement age required, and 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 you know the average age of the professoriate is I don't know where it is. It's in the 60s somewhere, um, and you see how in fact the elderly monopolize the resources and make it impossible for the young to sort of come up. And this is, another, this, is a, this is a sort of demographic image of the kind of concentration of power and wealth at the top that you, know, you talk about in, in your movie and that, that, that is you know, sort of a factor in inequality in our time. Um, and, that is, and there has to be some way to redistribute the goods. That's what we're looking at. Is we're, so this, come, this gets me to my favorite pet obsession, which is universal basic income. 
um, which uh, tragically is now associated with people like Elon Musk. I say tragically because it, that discredits it in my book. But um, we're going to have to ha find some way to redistribute wealth um, once work <laughs> has come to an end. Um, and all the resources are hoarded by either this gerontocracy or by what is actually happening by the, you know, the technological magnates. You know, I struggled a lot with universal basic income as, as a thing because I felt that, you know, we are, you're absolutely right, but we're at this strange time where if you listen to like Thomas Piketty, let's say the darling of of left-wing economists, and you listen to Steve Bannon, they're actually saying the exact same thing, that when you have this level of inequality, the only two pathways is sort of right-wing populism and left-wing populism. Right. Uh, I had a lot of, I had this tension inside of whether to include universal basic income in the movie or not. And the reason that I didn't is because my thought was that automation is so encompassing and it's so transformative in all these different ways. And we live in a time where sort of the great tragedy of the age is the sort of delusion that you could watch a TED talk and learn theoretical physics in 10 minutes. <laughs> and especially in documentaries, there's this sort of push to offer a solution to this. Mm -hmm. And I am so fearful of either positive tax income credits or universal basic income becoming seen as a solution because you could just as easily create a class of people who are just like addicted to Oxycontin with Oculus Rifts, like enjoying VR and you know living the semi-vegetative states on their $10,000 stipend a year. So I feel like that putting too much at this point into that possibility as a solution is somewhat, is a little dangerous. A apropos of the, the last question and its answer and also your mention of the Mill Girls, uh, at the moment, and for the past 20 or 30 years at least, the, the benefits and the miseries of automation have been very unevenly spread. There, there are still factories in China where our iPads are produced, uh, Foxconn City in particular, where 300,000 people work, and the suicide rate is way above normal, and we, uh, we used to deal with factories. When you bought a Ford, you knew it came from the Ford factory, but now we deal with marketers such as Amazon and Apple and uh, Google, and we never see what goes on in, in the factories. In fact, the factories have put up nets to keep people from successfully killing themselves um, th in order to get changes in labor laws and regulations. Um, 150 people had to threaten to jump off the, build the top of the building. Um, so not everybody's benefiting, and, and the benefits and the miseries don't seem to be evenly distributed. What well, here's happen? a man who has actually filmed no. at the Foxconn factory in China, so okay. you can talk about it. You know, I think that there's one thing that happened, and if you look at it historically, is that initially when factories manufacturing began to be automated, there was this burst of 50, 10 or 15 years of news reporting, which is very similar to the reporting of today mm -hmm. about sort of how manufacturing jobs will disappear. But what happened is that humans had a tremendous advantage in terms of precision, in terms of fine motor skills, and essentially what things you could do with your finger. So as manufacturing shifted to things like the production of electronics, humans held on to this competitive advantage of working with tiny little screws. And that's what still, when you go to the Foxconn factories and their satellite factories, that's still the jobs that they do, and some QC jobs, kind of like helping you with the iPad at CVS. Now, in the last 10 to 15 years, there's just been a combination of machine learning and improvements in precision, in manufacturing precision, really created this sort of watershed moment where much more of that manufacturing, which was safe uh, from automation, is being very actively automated, and China is investing very actively in robotic technology. So I feel like that, that it's, and we were almost, it's almost like the syndrome of like the boy who cried wolf because there was such kind of, pre robots are so kind of, you know, trendy and people predicted this kind of cataclysmic displacement for so long. I think that now we're not quite grappling with it because we're having trouble believing it in a certain way. So the, the next question also related to the mills is what happens when the factories leave? That's, that usually is, a, there's usually a period of, of disaster, no factory, there are many churches that have been around for hundreds of years and buildings, but no factory has ever existed for more than 160 years. Labor forces, uh, you know, where the labor force comes from changed, what people require uh, uh, changes, and uh, factories, you know, have left Michigan, and you want to take uh, um, 
you know, the, the city doesn't have enough money to provide water, so they outsource the water uh, supply in, in Flint and end up poisoning people. Factories leave devastation in their, their wake. What's going to happen in China when all these factories are closed? You know, I think that for a long time, the elasticity of the service sector was this, also was this thing that allowed us to take our eye off the automation of manufacturing. But at, right now, what's happened as a result of also a lot of these other parallel advances is that as, as uh, parts of a service sector are being automated, there's less place for the manufacturing workers to go. Whereas traditionally, let's say, as let's say when agriculture and the amount of uh, agricultural workers required you know, became significantly less, those workers moved into manufacturing. So as we're moving, there's just not going to be enough sectors for workers to move into, and you're, and you're not really going to be able to just educate your way out of it just because the numbers don't quite add up. Add up. Well, but it's a tragedy what you're describing, all those things. But. And on that joyful note... <laughs> uh, any, <laughs> any cheerful <laughs> uh, final thoughts? Uh, any cheerful final thoughts? Um, not really. That's, uh, we that's tried. pretty depressing. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I am curious to know what... Uh, I, I, I recommend, even though it's actually not one of McEwen's better novels, I recommend his novel where, you know, you have a, you have a robot that is more ethical than the human, and it's, a, it's an interesting flip. You know, it's... it's I can't wait to read Ian McEwan's book. That's yeah. going to be an interesting spin yeah. on the whole topic. Well, thank you, uh, Judith Shulevitz and Maxim Pozdorovink, for your kind participation and enlightenment. This was a tricky topic, but I think we covered a lot of it. Um, believe it or